Hi, I'm Tom Lonberg, the Chief Curator and Curator of History at the Evansville Museum of Arts, History and Science in Evansville, Indiana. I'm here with my friend and colleague, Tori Schendel Cox, the museum's Virginia G. Schrader Curator of Art. We welcome you to 2021's first edition of Tipsy Topics with Tori and Tom, where we live at the crossroads of education and entertainment. We have a really interesting show in store for you today. But just before we dive in, we'd like to thank our friends at Carson's Brewery for sponsoring Tipsy Topics. Carson's is located at 2404 Lynch Road in Evansville, and their tap room is open seven days a week. Each Monday, they have free trivia at 7 p.m. and beer bingo at the same time on Wednesdays. You can find out more at www.carsonsbrewery.com. We also invite you to visit us in person at the Evansville Museum Fridays and Saturdays from 11 to 5 and Sundays from 12 to 5 p.m. And you may also visit us at www.emuseum.org. It's now my real pleasure to turn it over to the ever vibrant and super knowledgeable Tori Schendel Cox to introduce our special guest. Tori, I understand we're getting in the way way back machine today to visit some really interesting art, culture, and history in today's episode. Tori? Tom, you always do the best introductions, and I am so excited to, to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Pilloid, who is an assistant professor at art, oh, sorry, of art history at Rutgers University Camden. Having earned her MA, MBA, and PhD from the University of Michigan, she originally studied 16th century Japanese art. However, she switched to Italian Renaissance art after a fateful trip to Florence, Italy, and has become an authority on 16th century Florentine painting, drawing, and sculpture. Her publications include Pontormo at San Lorenzo, The Making and Meaning of a Lost Renaissance Masterpiece, Italian Drawings, Florence, Siena, Modena, Bologna, Drawings in Swedish Public Collections, and has a forthcoming book titled Global Visions, a World Art History co-authored with Thomas DeCosta Kaufman. Furthermore, she is collaborating with the Metropolitan Museum of Art New York on the exhibition, Power and Identity, Portraits in the Florence of Cosimo the First de Medici, which is an exhibition of 107 objects, including paintings, drawings, books, letters, sculptures, medals, cameos, armor, and a dress. This exhibition opens April 19th, 2021. We are so excited to have you today. And this is just a fraction of the publications that she has um, produced. So please, by all means, look her up afterwards and have a happy, uh, uh, happy uh, venture down memory lane, as Tom was saying. So I think you've got some experience with this too. So welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. Thanks for inviting me. Really great to meet you both, uh, if only virtually. Indeed. So it's the way of the time. It is indeed. <laughs> And um, so just, just for the heck of it, the, uh, even though everything I'm talking about today is 16th century Florence, what you're seeing beside, behind me is a 16th century Japanese uh, set of folding screens uh, called the Ivy Lane, which, and I'm, I'm walking down the Ivy Lane right in front of it. I'm sort of responding. Anyway, what we're talking about today, and I'm sometimes I'll be reading, sometimes we'll be chatting among the three of us. So we'll just take it, take it easy and enjoy. The top slide that you see here, my um, frontispiece, actually highlights three works of art and armor from your collection. So the people who are lucky enough to come see these things really ought to do it. Um, uh, two paintings and a suit of armor. And you would think they have no connection, but you'll see that they do. Um, so I'm going to um, begin with something that's not in your collection, but you're going to find out that it leads straight to the center painting on the first on our opening screen here. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. And indeed, here we are. So my presentation today is going to have a lot of information about the Medici family of Florence in the 16th century. As you know, probably 
in the late 1300s, they started to rise out of um, essentially a very average family into a banking powerhouse. They funded uh, the popes. They eventually were giving loans to people like Henry VIII, etc. And indeed, we are in the period of Henry VIII um, when we hit Cosimo I de' Medici and his wife, Eleonora of Toledo. This is a portrait of Eleonora. Uh, and we're gonna see Cosimo, her spouse near the end. So don't, don't despair, he will get some time as well. So Eleonora, as we see her here, is called Eleonora of Toledo because her family came from Toledo, Spain. She was born in 1522 and died at only the age of 40 of tuberculosis in 62. Um, she herself was born in Salamanca. Uh, her dad was called Don Pedro Alvarez de Toledo, um, and he was the Viceroy of Naples. So she had an interesting childhood in that she grew up in a Spanish household, completely Spanish speaking, dressing and customs but they were in Italy. Now, however, being in Naples in the 1520s in Italy was to be in Spain. It was part of the Spanish empire and her father, Don Pedro, was an emissary and representative of the head of the Spanish royal house, Charles V, um, whose reach was quite vast, not just what we consider to be modern Spain, but what we're looking at is the foundation of the Habsburg Empire. So parts, all kinds of parts across Europe, down through Spain, of course, Naples, uh, a tiny part near the Vatican City, all kinds, quite a large um, empire in the end. Eleonora, as I said, grew up in the Spanish speaking household and we would have to say that it was as if she were brought up in a Habsburg court up in Belgium somewhere. Um, in 1539, she was married to Cosimo de' Medici. She was only 17, by the way, and he was barely 20. So uh, they were quite young. He was the newly appointed head or capo of the Florentine state. Um, and Eleonora, who of course had never met him, um, uh, was sent with a retinue of 100 people and uh, multiple galleys to sail to the port, get out at Pisa, and then come across land to Florence in, of course, extremely ornately decorated um, carriages and so forth. Her arrival was celebrated in a formal entrance including a triumphal possession through the city. And at various spots throughout the city, there were uh, temporary triumphal arches erected that had imagery on them and sculptures on them made of things like paper mache. Uh, so of course we don't have any of that, just descriptions, but they celebrated her Habsburg heritage. And for Cosimo, this was a great coup because he was just, quote, a civilian. Uh, they were not even really aristocrats at this point, although two earlier Medici had been elevated to the title of Duke. He didn't have that title. It was not hereditary. Hence, he is marrying somebody who's pretty close to the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. Mm -hmm. She is also coming from wealth, something he also needed desperately. He was very short on liquid assets. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. So, so elevated, who would do the elevating of, of title? Ah, eventually it has to come from Charles V. Char it, will be, it will be the Holy Roman Emperor who will recognize much later Cosimo, when Cosimo is an old man, as a Grand Duke, which will turn it into a Grand Duchy, um, and put Florence on a par with the other royal houses of Europe. And that's what he's trying to get to for 40 years. So first he's capo, literally C-A-P-O meaning head in Italian, head of the Florentine city state, which is a tiny, tiny thing. 
then he becomes Duke, but it's not a grand duchy. It's, it's a very, uh, it's not even as important as Mantua or Ferrara, um, et cetera. And then by uh, 1564, unfortunately after her death is when it becomes a grand duchy. She was never a grand duchess. She only got to be duchess. Um, but the rest is history. The Medici dynasty um, continued until the 1740s, and then there was a secondary uh, branch as well. So um, they, they founded a dynasty. Hope that answered question number one. It did. Thank you. In my pleasure. So we have a written description of the wedding and her entrance, and that's kind of neat. Um, because he told us, and this is appropriately here, I mentioned, that she wore for her uh, entrance, and she was, for all the city to see, a beautiful red dress decorated in gold. Um, he actually uses the word uh, kermisi, uh, C-H-E-R-M-I-S-I, and says it was of satin richly decorated with, the, with designs of beaten gold. She also wore the jewels that Cosimo, her spouse to be, had given her for her engagement, which included a pair of pearl earrings, which she wears here, and a big old hunk of a diamond ring, which she is quite ostentatiously displaying. In this portrait, which Bronzino, uh, in case you don't know this artist, B-R-O-N-Z-I-N-O, -O. Uh, I work on him a lot, I publish on him a lot. Uh, he's a fantastic portraitist, very known for that. Um, Bronzino probably was commissioned to paint this the year of their marriage in 1539, um, uh, possibly 1540. Um, the silk that we're looking, and so she's probably in her wedding dress, and I should say parenthetically, we think of wedding dresses as being in white or pale colors, but that's of course just a very localized modern custom. Um, in the Renaissance, and specifically in Venice, the tradition was wedding dresses for women were red. So this is not too odd. However, the fact that the chronicler mentions precisely the type of red, kermisi, as I'll show you, is kind of significant. So the silk from velvet uh, is made from silk. And of course, um, the velvet of the dress itself was a proud Florentine product, even though the Chinese had developed the technique for it. Um, the kind of global um, aspect of this is found in its color. The kermesi or kermes, in English we call this K-E-R-M-E-S, was the most highly prized and expensive fabric dye in 16th century Europe. The color was reserved only for the richest of fabrics and occasions. And it's undoubtedly for this portrait that there's a subliminal message here, several. One is the event that's happening to her is of extreme importance. Number two, um, uh, no, no uh, money has been spared in arraying her and the festivities in the richest opulence humanly possible. Um, it also thirdly points to uh, something that um, Cosimo had to keep in mind for quite a number of years, which is that she was bringing him a lot of money. Um, her dowry was gigantic, um, and he instantly could use it, as you know how dowries worked in this period. Um, uh, and her father was rich in his own right because he was an aristocrat, his family was aristocratic from Toledo with a long inheritance of properties. Uh, on mainland Spain, as well as what they owned in Naples. So it also therefore symbolized her patrilineal privilege and wealth. Now this same lineage was going to ensure uh, that her children ultimately, as I said, would be considered on a par with other independent rulers in the Habsburg empires. Um, this increase in status, this little baby step up 
uh, is one of the gifts she was bringing to Florence along with herself. So this costume is extremely um, redolent with significance. It's worth noting, I think, uh, although we might want to say that she, and she did become eventually an art patron in her own right, I think it's we have to say that at 17, and given that she, prepare yourself for this, she spoke no Italian at all. Um, <laughs> I think that the patron must have been her husband. Uh, Bronzino was beginning to become a court or painter at this point. He'd bloom into it in the next few years. Now, I said that the course of this color uh, comes from the East. And uh, those of you who are scientifically or uh, 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 biologically inclined may already know that the color comes from the desiccated bodies of a louse. These are insects that, so it's icky. Okay, uh, in, insects that are all dried up and before 1540, which is when this dress was made, um, the real source of these insects was only from Armenia, Central Asia, or Eastern Siberia. So this is, this is an exotic import to create a dye that's really expensive. So all of this is is signaled by this incredible dust and it's also not to say covered with pearls and gold that's we can easily check that out now you all know that the ultimate source of the gold is sort of is southern africa traded via north through egypt um, went across the mediterranean on boats in all over the place um, if we take a look at the pearls there's a lot of pearls going on here um, in the area where her upper shoulders on either side. There's a beautiful net um, there, uh, which uh, is studded with pearls. Um, I think we have a let's take a look and see if I, what I have next as a slide there. Out of curiosity before we do so. Yes, so as white generally symbolizes purity, uh, virginity, did the color red have a specific symbol? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a symbol of power, essentially. Okay. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> um, it, it is not a symbol of docility or, or purity, not really. Um, that's not the message. Uh, of the dress and it's not the it's not really the message if you think about it alliances of european um uh, dynasties are not really um concerned with acquiring purity but they're concerned with a, a, accumulating greater power greater wealth mm -hmm. um so it makes sense if you look at it that way i know it is very counter to what we might have expected. And that's why I thought it'd be fun to go over this. That's um, first things first, I guess, power. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Now, <laughs> take, take a look at the next slide as I go on. I think I have some details of her. Yes, mm. um, I wanted you see, to, to see how exquisite this is. Um, mm. The uh, pearls, of course, all match. Which, me, which is in an age before cultured pearls is not so simple. Plus they have to come from Spain or Mallorca. Um, and they're, so they're imported too. Number two, I do want you to notice these beautiful little gold loops that edge, yes, exactly where the cursor is pointing. Think of the painter painting all of these infinitesimally tiny loops and shading them with highlights and shadows. Every loop has its own three-dimensional character. It's, this is a masterpiece. This painting is a masterpiece. Um, so Eleonora there looking absolutely wonderful. The item of clothing where the pearls and these loops are is a netting that covers your shoulders for modesty before the red velvet dress begins. That netted area, that little netted thing is called a partlet, P-A-R-T-L-E-T. And also in this slide, you can notice, um, I think that Tori hovered for a moment 
on that little space there at the top of her sleeve, her sleeves are detachable and tied on with bows. We see two of the red satin ties right there. This of course means that all of the outfits can be interchangeable and you can change your sleeves, put different colors on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is the common way that dresses were manufactured, I should say, literally manufactured by hand in the 16th century. So, um, also her hair um, is caught up in a netting that is similar, um, similar to this. Um, I think the next slide I want to see, I can't remember which details I gave you. Oh, those, as I, let me say another few words before I get to her hand, but leave the hand up so we can really enjoy it. Notice also that there are gilded and silvered balls, these hanging there. Those are also ties. These are tying her sleeve um, to the bodice, to the part near her chest. Again, think of the care, the detail that went into producing this. We even have the names of the people who produced uh, the fabrics, wow. the uh, gold bands that cover it, um, mm -hmm. the embroidery on her sleeves. All of those are recorded in payments in the State Archives of Florence, which is unbelievably fascinating. Uh, and many people have worked on this. There's a whole book about it, by the way. So in any case, now we're focusing on as she touches or places her hand um, at her chest. And this is very likely a gesture meant to imply uh, devotion, and in this case, probably marital devotion. Uh, to her new spouse, and as this is a marriage portrait, um, she wears, as I mentioned, the diamond ring that he gave her, a very expensive uh, piece, again, um, and like the pearls, an import um, from possibly as far away as Afghanistan in these mm -hmm. days. Um, and uh, it's, I will show you an example that where you can see what kind of ring this really was. And then the ring, the lower ring um, on her pinky is a, actually an ancient Roman intaglio, an ancient Roman reverse cameo, um, which has uh, a little, I, I can't show you the, it, it shows hands grasping when holding hands which is a Rome and a cornucopia. It's just symbols of concord. And these were Roman symbols used for when someone engaged in a contract with another party, these symbols were used and they were also used for weddings. So in this interesting juxtaposition of a flashy diamond ring from far off in the exotic world of today with something from the ancient Roman background of Florence itself, if you will, because Florence was founded by the Romans in 79 of the Common Era as a colony. It sort of spans the entire globe and history, if you will, uh, up to that point of the world. So even the rings are statements about power, um, succession, uh, claims to antiquity, and so forth. So it's a pretty amazing picture. This painting is in Prague, by the way, in the National Gallery, and it, it's a little bit under life size. So you can kind of imagine uh, what size it would be. Now, I um, brought her up because we're going to be experts on her in a moment. So this is when she's first married. So let's skip ahead a couple of years to Bronzino's next main portrait of her. Oh, my diamond ring, excuse me. So th this is not the ring she has, but this is one we have from the Medici collections and it has the Medici coat of arms in the center. It's a gigantic table cut diamond. If you know diamond cuts, uh, in fact, I know someone on this panel who has a diamond ring, I think. <laughs> yeah. am, I, am I correct? Yeah. 
Well, I said just a little one. <laughs> Yay. Now, the <laughs> wonderful. The difference between your diamond ring and this is that we have faceted cuts that increase the brilliance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they hadn't they hadn't developed that yet. And yeah. so the typical way was table cut, which is what you see here. The value was still astronomical. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have her rings. They didn't make it to us. This kind of thing tends to get recycled. Um, but in any event, so uh, going on to the next, please. Out of curiosity, yes. more so for that technique style, how would they actually make that coat of arms in that head of that diamond? Oh my goodness. Now you're asking tough questions. Um, so it's engraving. It's whatever tools you would use for engraving, except to engrave into diamond, you technically are probably using also diamond. Uh, diamond, um, uh, they ground diamond into dust mm -hmm. and those particles were then attached with some kind of adhesive to their tools uh, and could be used to make extremely fine carvings. Yeah. That's amazing. It is amazing. It is amazing. It's amazing we even have this, this example yes. um, because over the years, many, many things were lost from the collections, even things, ironically, up until 1919, um, a gigantic diamond said to have been the biggest diamond ever found uh, in the pre-modern world was still in the Medici in uh, storages and was lost thereafter. Oh, wow. Read for that, probably stolen, but we don't know. I mean, they, they, la they were there for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And that diamond was about this big. Woo! <laughs> yes. Uh, no, I don't have it here. Relax. I do oh, not. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> do not have it. Wish I did. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll take the hope diamond, though. <laughs> yeah, I think I could use it. If, you know, frankly, at that level, it would be a kick and a half to use it as a paperweight, don't you think? Mm -hmm. If anybody noticed that little trinket, yes. <laughs> on your desk. Um, so let's go to the next slide there. So um, uh, interestingly, despite the fact that these two had never met, um, according to many different sources, they really had an almost modern kind of fell in love relationship. It's the stuff of novels, honestly. Um, uh, he writes of her in the most loving and adoring manner, and she of him uh, as well. Uh, so we cut ahead um, several years here to about 1544, 1545. Um, and we see Eleonora again by Branzino. Uh, this is in Uffizi, Eleonora with one of her sons. There used to be a debate about which son, but I think it's uh, Giovanni. Um, and here we see her against a fantastic blue sky painted in expensive azurite, by the way. Again, she had noticed the similarities. Before I look at the differences, she has um, uh, her hair in a net, which is studded with pearls. She wears a partlet also studded with pearls. It's similar, but not identical to the earlier one. Uh, and then um, she is certainly recognizable. She also has her pearl earrings, still the same ones, the long teardrops, same, same ones. However, she now wears a dress of extraordinary um, uh, panel cut velvets with gold embroidery on the chest um, with uh, sort of, it's a combination of ivory color, a brownish color, black and then the the actual gold threads that create the main pattern in the middle of her chest and then down on her lap the um, emblem or image then in the center of her chest is meant to evoke a pomegranate if uh, and if yes perfect and if you know pomegranates of course they contain with them in them many seeds 
their symbolic meaning from uh, antiquity, actually. Mm -hmm. um, first, uh, this, the number of seeds and sides always comes as the kind of surprise. Um, and so in Christian times, they became a symbol of the church, which encloses within it many, many congregants. But it, its other meaning, and here is this is what it stands for, is fecundity. Uh, that she herself is like a vessel that produces many, many uh, beautiful and luscious seeds. And indeed, she she was pregnant something like 11 times. Not all of them survived, uh, but she had a great many children um, starting in 1540, the year after they were married, of course, um, uh, both boys and girls. So we see that here. Here she proudly shows off uh, a male heir to the, the duchy uh, and um, in the background, we probably see the marshes of, P of, of the land around Pisa near the ocean. A lot of her own dowry and money had been spent on building a palace out there for the Medici and also eventually went towards uh, irrigation projects to um, reduce the swampiness uh, of the land, which is kind of interesting. So she, that's behind her. You, now you have to start beginning to think, how much is she dictating some of what the painter depicts here? Because uh, she looks, she's powerful, she's imposing. It's possible she's based on the Mona Lisa, which Bronzino mm -hmm. knew, uh, Leonardo's famous painting. She shows behind her an expansive territory that she herself is financing. This is an interesting new juxtaposition. And of course she is producing the heirs to the throne. And she points to one right there. <laughs> if I could ask, yes, you mentioned that she might be dictating what's here. How 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 did that generally work as far as the patron or the artist who was deciding what was going to be the you know within the painting itself, a portrait. Uh, in my period and in the place in which I'm studying here, this has been much debated, Tom, uh, and. It used to be thought, um, and this was a holdover from the 19th century idea of the artist as a renegade neurotic soul who has deep thoughts that's, that he or she um, concretizes out of their minds into the artwork they create. Um, we Really reading the documents and really looking at what they say, it is very unlikely that the painter had more than an, a modicum of input into what was depicted. Um, and also, I, I should say parenthetically, still in the moment we're discussing here, artists don't buy um, panels to paint on or canvases to paint on just for fun. They buy them when they have a commission to use them. Uh, and that's part of the, the answer to your question, that the things reflect the patron. Now, the style is a different matter. Um, and, and that's where you get into a subjective conversation, definitely, about how the artist's own style is his or hers alone, what it reflects, how it got there, you know, how it was built up. Um, but then uh, that would be a whole nother chat. Uh, Thank you. So hopefully, hopefully that helps. Um, you. You're welcome. Next slide, please. So, and this is a detail. Notice she has upgraded to now a gigantic diamond necklace or pendant, I should say, hanging from her pearl necklace. Um, two necklaces and notice the size of the lower strand of pearls. These are incredibly large. These really existed. Um, and we even have documents for the purchase of these pearls, um, which had to be very carefully collected via an agent to get them all the, the same size and quality. Um, here again, you see that her sleeves are detachable. There, there are clear little sort of puffy ties that attach them, um, just like the other dress. So those are the, the commonalities. Now, 
not only is she more monumental in this picture, um, but her face is a bit rounder. And this is something that came to my attention in working on the Metropolitan Museum of Art show. Um, if you look back at the Prague uh, picture, her, and we don't have to go back, but her cheekbones, you can actually see a bit of cheekbone. Um, and I don't think this is just pure idealization, although of course, the almost perfect roundness of her jaw echoes the circlet of pearls around her neck, which echoes the lower level of circlet, which echoes her waistline. This is all true. Um, and those are artistic um, manipulations on the part of Branzino. But the truth is, after having a number of children, um, she was not as thin as she was in the beginning. Um, I see Tori is shaking her <laughs> head. I, I wouldn't dare comment. <laughs> I can really. <laughs> Being always be very quiet at this moment. Me, me too. <laughs> I, you, I simply absented myself there for a moment. Okay, now, um, so next slide, please. Out of curiosity, oh, though, yes, yes, um, that was something that I was really interested in. When she was shown in her wedding gown, there was no necklace. And I know that she did have that beautiful collar that did come up that was part of uh, yes. her garment. But so then was a lack of a necklace just to show like that upgrade or was it because it clashed or? Uh, well, that's a good, I think, I th here's what I think. I mm -hmm. think that the pearls, um, are coming later because they're coming via her Spanish and Habsburg connections. She's got a direct linkage. I think in the Prague portrait, um, my guess is that it showcases the jewelry that he gives mm. her. And we're gonna come back to that at a later point on a final little point I'm going to make about her, um, that in a way the Prague portrait celebrates for him, his acquisition of her, if you will. Um, so, so maybe if you'll bear with me, mm -hmm. um, that I'll have a little evidence to that effect, but that's why it's the jewelry he gave her as gifts that is highlighted there. Um, yeah, good question, good question. Next, oh, and I knew you'd like to see, as she mm -hmm. leans in, what? <laughs> that was so, clear. It, that looks very familiar, does it not? Mm -hmm. This is Eleonora with her son Francesco, who would later become the Grand Duke. He will he will become the first after his father uh, in uh, uh, 1574. Uh, here, of course, he's little. So this is believed to have been painted between 1549 and 1551. I'm going to call it 1550, just easier to remember approximately. Um, uh, this is in the uh, 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 Museum um, of the National Gallery of San Mateo at, at Pisa. And it's a very important picture. It's, it's not actually probably painted by Bronzino. It's a workshop production, but it's clear that he designed it. And you can see that by saying it's based on the painting we just looked at at length, right? Her hand across her chest, her face, et cetera, the, the uh, pearls around her neck and then the pearls lower on her chest. Um, all of those elements are still in place. Um, and that another ch a child is there, another male heir is there. What's different is she's had another, I think it's four children between the painting we just saw and this saw and this. She's now had uh, over five children. And um, she is also perhaps, I have argued in the Metropolitan Museum of Art entry, um, I suspect she is with child again in this image because she is wearing an outer garment. If you would trace that, it's a deep plum color open at the front. That's, it looks like a house coat, but of incredibly beautiful materials of satin with gold bands, um, uh, known as a Zimara, Z-I-M-A-R-R-A, Zimara. 
um, which is an open cloak. It was worn by men and women alike, but it's particularly worn by women when they are pregnant because it was considered more modest. It could be closed. If you look at the top, it has a collar. It can be closed all the way up to the top. Uh, and yep, and the, the enclosures are frogs. We call them frogs. Uh, frog enclosures where there's a knot of material on one side and a loop that comes over. Um, so she's probably with child. Um, and the iconography or symbolism of fecundity, which was one of her own, uh, she was often referred to as her most fecund duchess. And in, this is a positive. This means she is, again, not only did she bring him all that money and a good love life, but she brought him what he needed, which was a lot of kids, including male heirs. So as we look at this, when the hand is at her, if you will allow, perhaps even signaling by touching her belly that she is the fecund duquesa, the duchess. And what I like about this portrait is now Francesco, who's probably um, uh, between around 10-ish, around in there, again, some debate. Notice his proper left hand echoes her hand. It's parallel to mommy's hand, but it also points to his own chest. He says to you, I'm one who came from within inside her. And then he points back at her saying she is the one who provides. It's a beautiful, beautiful orchestration of the hands. Um, completely decorous, completely modest, uh, but it highlights all these things about, that are so important to them in terms of dynastic and family continuance. Now, this particular picture, as I said, is workshop, but it is an official image of Eleonora, and we don't know if there's a lost original by Bronzino or whether he designed it and he has his studio make many, many versions. If we may go forward, see a few more, go I, next slide, please. One of which, does anybody recognize this, please? A little bit. <laughs> what are we looking at there? We are looking at a beautiful portrait of Eleonora that hangs in the Gothic room at the Evansville Museum of Arts, History and Science as part of the Celebration of Women exhibition. Isn't that wonderful? It makes my heart go cool. <laughs> an exhibit that Tori worked tirelessly on. I, I bet, I bet. I wish I could see it in person, but I'm, I saw parts of it virtually and it's wonderful. It was a wonderful thing. And she's, so this is how Tori and I met. We met v through Eleonora, this particular Eleonora. Um, and uh, the first thing you'll notice, of course, is that Francesco is missing, but she's the same. The artist has just added a hand to cover where he was. Now, as I said, there are other versions of this and you should not imagine this is low quality or anything such as that because in fact, the irony is it's not the Prague marriage portrait. It's not the Uffizi, uh, Eleonora with Giovanni, but it's Eleonora with Francesco, this Eleonora that is the official image of Eleonora da Toledo. It's frescoed all through the, in the apartments of the Palazzo Vecchio where they lived. And that means, since they live there, that they chose that image to represent her for eternity. So it is a very important image of her um, that you have. And since it is the official image, it's vital that lots of copies be made. This is also something that, that we as contemporary modern people have to get our heads around. Again, from a 19th century idea of the romantic artist who creates a masterpiece and then destroys you know, all the drawings that lead up to it. That's, that's the story about Michelangelo's last sculpture that everyone loves so much. Um, Th that kind of thing is actually anachronistic. 
frankly. Um, in the Renaissance, the early Renaissance, the high Renaissance, late Renaissance, even through the 17th century, making multiples of official court portraits, obviously they don't have photographs, they don't have Instagram, they, you know, they, can't, they don't have iPhones, is how you demonstrate the extent and, extent and depth of your importance. You send these as diplomatic gifts to your family members far and wide. You send one to Henry VIII, you send one to Francis I of France, you send them to Charles V, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the very fact that multiples of this particular image exist mean it's the most important one. And now the paintings, each painting could be by a different hand. So let's take a little look. Let's delve deeper. Next, please. These are good detail I, so that you can take a look at the um, color of her cheeks, I think, is significant. The color of the flesh. Um, look at her partlet. We're going to see a detail of that later, the netting across her chest. Notice those earrings, they're signature by now. That, that's really signature earrings. Um, and so is the partlet and so is the hairnet. She was her whole and everything she appears with these. So there's your picture. And I think you can see and you will see in details, it's very nicely painted. Maybe go to the next. Now, this is not your painting. However, look at it. It is the same image now cropped without her hands. This picture, if you look closely in the upper part of the painting, on the green background, it's even inscribed with her name. It calls her Lenora without the E. Instead of Eleonora, it's Lenora, but it is she, the Toledo, and it's, it, has, it says wife of Cosimo in Latin there. This picture is part of the collection of the Palazzo Pitti in Florence. Um, and this is a very bad photo taken by me. I hope no one's listening. Maybe we can edit this part out. No photographs were allowed. <laughs> we heard nothing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no. You know, hear no evil. So, okay. Now. So I, I'm, I, 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 I looked for this for a long time because I, it took me a long time to find it, but I wanted to find it for you. So if we go on to the next, we have here what we have the green background. Now here on the left is the Palazzo Pitti and on the right is yours. Wow. And there, there are differences if you look at the way in which the paint strokes are put in the partlet, the white paint strokes in the diamond shapes, it's much more painterly in yours. You see um, a mixture from white to ivory to pale. It's the same as well, I think, in the pearls. Um, uh, e e there's a flatness to the one in the Palazzo Pitti. In the pa actual painting, the way each tiny part is laid on. The tassel um, that hangs right at the very center, I see more feathering mm -hmm. in the tassel in your painting. Uh, that also, by the way, uh, pertains to the frog closures, the feathering on the edges, which I don't have a good detail of, but I wanted to alert you to, again, in the um, oh, yeah. Uh, painting in your museum that's more delicately done more and it's more painterly we call that which is one of those terms that if if you're not familiar with means that we see actual brush strokes we see a liveliness in the painting what do you think the checkering is different too slightly yeah yeah and absolutely with that feathering too i agree so in other words if you look at these, while they're, it's clear that they're from different hands, I think yours is superior in painting uh, quality 
Uh, and uh, I'm still working on thinking about who in the studio it might be. So we might get there eventually, actually. Um, I've been thinking uh, it might be uh, Lodovico uh, Buti. We'll, we'll look into that. But let's go on to the next. When this was going along, was there, I can't think of a better term, quality control? I mean, <laughs> what, what, did they, I mean what, was there any goal as far as yeah. how they were executing them? Well, Tom, it's a really good question because qual the quality control is the identifiability of the subject that this is from the very same cartoon, which, uh, uh, which was probably a physical big paper cartoon, probably made of multiple sheets of paper glued together, made by Bronzino, which has her exact outfit, has where the pearls are, has the net on her head, has everything drawn, but it is a drawing in black charcoal on paper. So the method of laying on paint strokes is, in, is something that cannot really be dictated. Um, and therefore, and, and so the slippage here between one person's handling of paint and the other is not extremely important to either him or to the patrons who receive it, as long as it looks, oh, it looks just like it. It looks just like the other one, then it's fine. Sure, thank you. Sure, next. And this is, I brought this detail um, precisely so you could look at the little um, uh, stepped ziggurat design at the, at the center bottom, yep, perfect. So you can see the tassel uh, and the strokes in it. And even I like very much um, the uh, loop closing on the right side, um, the right side of the zimera. There's a loop close, clo there we go. Look at how very vivid those strokes of highlighting, they oh. rest right on the surface. I, I, that it, it's vibrant, it's, you know. Um, I, I felt that we had to see those. Um, in all fairness, they're so tiny on the real painting. I know. So tiny. And I know. But thank. And, but these e details, you really can see. Yeah. It's it's very like it was very nice. Um, so next, please. Ah. So this. And this is a preview uh, of something that will be in the Metropolitan Museum of Art entries that I have not shared with anybody else. So on the right hand side, you see, um, great, the Prague Eleonora, she's young. And the detail right beneath her, thank you, is the center of the band across her chest. On the other side of the screen um, is the 1550 Eleonora, so now at least 10 years later, and I'm again focusing on that band across her chest. Next slide, please. Ah, did you notice a change? I have zeroed in with blue lines at the center of the center of that band. That's, that's the 1550. And now let's take a look at the Prague one, please, on the right. And that's the 1539 to 40. If you go back and examine the continuing pattern of these loops, which go up their sleeves and across their chests, if you don't look closely, they just look like a continuous pattern. But they are not. And in both cases, they have a culminating meeting point, which is dead center of her bust, which we're focusing on right now, okay? And for instance, and the one on the right where Tori has her cursor, the loops of gold are slightly more rounded, the main line of the groups are slightly more rounded than all of the ones to the left and right. You'll have, you can go back and check me on this, but I guarantee. And in fact, when you look at them, you realize that what you're looking at there are is the letter C, two of them adorsed, that is back to back. C for Cosimo. She's his. Every, 
Oh, wow. Yeah. And once you see it, you can't not see it anymore. Because it predates Chanel, of course. I don't think anybody's, I, I mean, it, it, no one's ever published it, no one's ever noticed it. So I've, this is in my, in my stuff for the Met, Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now, and that makes sense. That's part of my argument that the patron of this very early marriage portrait is her husband, that it's the jewelry and with which he adorns her. It's the silk and velvet that's produced in Florence. Yes, she's brought him riches and things, but she is stamped with his monogram. She oh. is his, she is Cosimo's. And now look to the right. And like what, e. Yes, and do you see that I've drawn two E's, a Dorst? Oh my. She's now <laughs> her own woman. She's now her own woman. And she is her excellency, which begins with an E, Eleonora, E-E. Mm -hmm. Wow. And by the way, the way that E is, the curly roundedness of it, that that is an orthographic style of Florentine 16th century handwriting. You can, and I think that's why I noticed it because I do a lot of archival research. I noticed the E's first and then I went back and said, how could I have missed the C's? Uh, how in the heck? Yeah. That's brilliant. So out of curiosity for our viewers, is there a publication on this possibly in the work? <laughs> well, <that's laughs> I need it. <laughs> yes. So, so in fact, um, it will be in short form. The Metropolitan Museum of Art catalog will come out at the end of April or the beginning of May. And I wrote the entries on both of these paintings and this is in there. It's also going to be in my Brunzino portrait book because I'm going to do a, a book just on Brunzino portraits. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot doing, doing, working on these. And I, I think this is, um, to me, when I saw it, I was really thrilled. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you. I'm glad. Oh you my. <laughs> so you, and, and when you look carefully, because you'll be able to study your painting, you'll see that at no other place in the whole decoration do the curls elongate out to create ease. They're always mm -hmm. slightly more squashed, mm -hmm. but take a look. It's subtle. I wish I can go back to work right now. <laughs> okay, but onward. And I'm, I'm probably, I'm, I'm looking at the time here. My goodness, I've talked forever. Um, let me go on, please. And I, so I have to, I have to um, uh, then go on just a little bit. I wanted to show you a few other people and link it back to other things in your collection. So in the next generation, Francesco the first, the little boy, grows up to be the Grand Duke, and he marries this lady, Joanna of Austria is what we call her. Joanna was a Habsburg. She's the daughter of Ferdinand I, who was Charles V's brother. Uh, so in the next generation, the Medici trade up. They don't just marry the daughter of a high level functionary of the emperor, they marry a relative of the emperor. They marry an actual Habsburg. And she has the Habsburg jaw, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> um, I brought her for a couple of reasons and you'll see why in a moment. Um, but speaking of dress and jewelry, she's covered in even more amazing jewels, um, including emeralds, um, a huge emerald on her bodice and in her hair. Um, with a ruby above and a pearl below. I mean, these are extremely ostentatious. Now, Joanna, who was born in 1547 and died in 1578, as I said, um, she was the youngest child of Ferdinand I, and she got married to Francesco in 1565. Here, unfortunately, the marriage was not a happy one. Um, and he had a girlfriend. Have you ever heard this story before? Um, and who waited until poor Joanna perished and he married his girlfriend uh, and made her duchess. Yes, it's happened before. It's not just <laughs> in the common era. Um, 
So she is shown, as I said, draped in these jewels. It's very likely that the pearls that she wears were given to her by Cosimo, her father-in-law. Um, we have uh, a mention of that in a document. The in her hair is this stunning garland. It's mixed of gold, pearls, and emerald set in multicolored enamel mounts. Now, emeralds come generally from Colombia in South America. They came to Europe via trade routes. Um, often they debarked at Cartagena, landed at Sevilla, Seville in Spain. And of course, Spanish connections for the Habsburgs are very easy and came forward. Um, in a few cases, they came from, uh, came around the Cope, uh, the, uh, the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, believe mm -hmm. it or not. And a few came even all the way, um, uh, from America via Mexico. Emeralds in Europe, therefore came from both Eastern and Western sources in this period and were therefore known as either occidental or oriental emeralds. The oriental ones are coming from obviously eastern areas, uh, including Persia, by the way. Um, if we go next to the next slide here, some detail maybe. Out of curiosity, since yes, we're talking about her jewelry, would it have been common practice or appropriate for Eleonora's pearls to be incorporated mm -hmm. in future family members' jewelry? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And um, you see she has at least four ropes of pearls here. Mm -hmm. She's probably wearing Eleonora's now re restyled in a new configuration plus extras wow. for herself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and your point is very well taken. Look at that. Your point is very well taken because we know for a fact, um, I think I have it in my notes here. Uh, right. Right. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. But, but for instance, some of these jeweled mounts that we're looking at, um, even in either here and in her hair, were then reset in another um, configuration. In one period, they were a belt, and in another period, they were a necklace. And they are they are tracked through the archives. So, exactly what you're suggesting happened for sure. Um, this detail really shows you, um, you know, the emphasis, particularly um, on that um, on that emerald. Um, the Mounts here were designed um, by a specific artisan from Flanders who the Medici hired to come because he was a master gold worker. Um, and the specific pearls and emeralds, uh, particularly this emerald, were given to him. He designed what we're looking at here. Um, let's take a look at the next slide. I think I wanted to show you, remember? Uh, yeah. Oh, and I also wanted to show you her earring. Um, which are in the shape of urns um, with gold mounts. Uh, you see that the material that's dark is a bit shiny. It could be um, a kind of agate. Um, we're not entirely positive about this, but one thing we do know from, again, archival entries is that earrings of this sort were absolutely made and they un the tops unscrewed and people put musk inside them as perfume. Oh. Uh, so they're very luxurious uh, to be able to have something like this. Um, uh, people also, musk was, and other things were also used to perfume gloves uh, in the Renaissance. So um, not only were the women adorned with jewels, but also they exuded sort of this aura of exotic perfume at the same time, which is pretty amazing. Um, and we, and it, it, there's a very good image. You see the emerald that's hanging off the back of her hair? Mm -hmm. And you could, it's just, these are huge chunks of... <laughs> huge. <laughs> yeah, I just, do, do not underestimate the emeralds. Um, next, please. Yeah. Yeah. 
Ah. And there, this is the object that, as I said, um, doubled as a belt sometimes of pearls and emeralds in. And the, the reason you see little bits of red and blue is because the gold mounts um, have been filled with blue and red enamel. And I know you have jewelry at your museum. You mm -hmm. have things that, that would be uh, comparable to this. Um, it's really beautiful. And also we do know that she was auburn haired so uh, with pale eyes. And so the complementary color of the green against her hair is also very well, very well thought out. And is this gray hair we see here? No, those are actual, are you ready for this? Those are paint strokes, in, very fine paint strokes in gold. Oh, wow. She's gilded. Yeah, we're, we, we're, we're, there's no modesty here. We're, you know, we're, we're we've reached. It we, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Tom. Yes, that, as far as gold leaf, am I? I think the question was um, how gold leaf Go ahead. and gold yeah. paint, could that be? Um, painters do occasion, as in the Middle Ages, of course, people not only put gold backgrounds uh, behind religious, you know, the Virgin Mary and Christ child in paintings, uh, but in fact, for all the fine details, they use liquid gold. Uh, in those paintings that falls out of favor in by in the 1450s um, when a more naturalistic approach is promoted by art theoreticians such as Leon Battista Alberti who says in a treatise on painting that putting gold is old fashioned no one does that anymore he says um, it's interesting in the 16th century, little bits of gold creep back in. Um, and Bronzino does um, put touches of pure gold. These are, these are made with a paintbrush that has about three hairs on it. Very fine. Um, and I caught Bronzino doing this in another portrait. Uh, this is not by Bronzino. This is by, I should say, his pupil, his premier pupil, Alessandro Allori. A-L-L-O-R-I, um, but I found Branzino snuck these in to a portrait of Francesco the uh, first along his temple line at the top. I, and I don't, I really don't know if anyone had ever noticed that either. Um, so very, she's gilded, she's jeweled, she's bejeweled, begilded, but be, she's bedazzled mm -hmm. completely. Um, next, please. This is, um, oh, where's my little, hmm, hit, yep, there it is. Um, I have a little arrow there. Um, this is just for, for total nerds who want to see what an inventory of jewels looks like. Um, so this is an inventory of jewels, and at the green marker it says, and you can read it, uno smeraldo, an emerald, um, orientale. So it, this is listing a, a big emerald. The whole page is all jewels, diamonds, emeralds, rubies, um, crowns, necklaces. But I pointed this out to show you, they really did call the diamond, the, um, I beg your pardon, the emeralds coming from the East as Oriental. They really knew the difference and thought it was key. So going on to the next slide, Joanna, um, is related to another one of your paintings. Yeah, drum roll. Mm -hmm. you know, where are the sound effects that I need? Anyway, <laughs> uh, you can edit them in, please. Um, so Joanna is over here on the left. Uh, we've just looked at Alori's Joanna of Austria. And this is your painting, which your marvelous curator brought to my attention as I believe a Habsburg princess, isn't that right? We, you knew, mm -hmm. we knew it was a Habsburg princess, but the mm -hmm. question was, could we identify her? Did we have any idea 
Uh, I think my light blew out. Oh, well. Um, did we have any idea who she was? Well, we do. I was able to identify her by looking at um, portraits of other Habsburgs in the Schloss or Castle Ambros, and she is Barbara. How's that for a straightforward name? Um, and she's the older sister of Joanna. So um, we're connected here again. We're we're Joanna is. Uh, the baby sister. Uh, this is her older sister, Barbara. Um, and as you can see, she's covered in jewels too. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're experts on all this. Um, one of the things that's very different is the little hat that she's wearing with the plume. And that is very typical um, of the Habsburgs in the North. The, that is to, and she this depicts her um, as she was um, probably on the eve of her marriage while she was still in the north um, in Austria, I should sp specify. And, you know, it's also it's a colder climate and they wore little felt hats, honestly. Uh, of course, if you're Habsburg, your little your little velvet felt hat has to have gold on um, jewels all stuck on the outside brim. But still. It's, it's a different climate. And you can see the slight resemblance between the two of them in the longer jaw that they have. Barbara, Barbara's was more pronounced, more like uh, the Habsburg jaw that eventually grows to be extremely prominent um, by the 18th century. Um, but also a kind of auburn colored hair, sort of uh, a creamy, pale complexion, they all do resemble one another quite a bit. So uh, Barbara, unfortunately, or fortunately, um, eventually sort of joined her sister. She, in the sense that she was sent to be married uh, to an Italian, she was sent down to be married to Alfonso II, uh, the Duke of uh, Ferrara. Uh, but unfortunately, she only lived to be 33 years old. Um, uh, but still, she and her sister had managed to reconnoiter one last time um, before that happened. Now, there are many versions of your panel as well. I don't have to reiterate why that is the case now because we've gone over it. Um, uh, but again, precisely because she's been, and this is an extra point we should keep in mind, precisely because she's been moved from Austria to live uh, now in Ferrara, one portrait of her has to stay in Austria with her family so they can remember what she looks like. So every time someone moves, that initiates portraiture making. Mm -hmm. One must be left behind and one, and then you have to have ones to send to maybe new family members. So once she marries Alfonso, uh, then he might be inclined to say, you know, we need to send this to my uncle. And so you, you get more and more portraits for that reason. Um, uh, marriages, the birth of children, all, all trigger more portrait making. So without, did you have a question, Tori? I saw a yeah, question. Yeah, out of curiosity. So in her hand, she's holding the handkerchief and Eleonora was also holding the handkerchief. What does that mean? <laughs> Don't you wish we knew? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have every. It's cold. <laughs> no, it's, it's a. Um, uh, it it is a motif that crops up. Uh, not just in Bronzino, but in the 16th century, and it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, a, a handkerchief or gloves, very very common, and it's pan European actually, um, in the end, it'll be pan-European. People have surmised that, okay, it's a luxury item. Uh, let's be honest, poor people don't have lovely linen lace edged handkerchiefs in this period. They don't have beautiful suede gloves that are the color of snow and perfumed, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, in that sense. And then the dog, of course, is, as I'm sure you all know, a symbol of fidelity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is also very, very probably why, as I said at the outset, 
this probably commemorates her marriage. So faithfulness, exactly. And notice she's wearing red. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. Once again, um, uh, with all, with a bunch of jewels everywhere, but that undergarment, that main garment, is again red, mm -hmm. slightly different cut. It's a Habsburg cut, but nonetheless. Let's see what we have next. Oh. Wow. Well, that looks familiar. <laughs> Tom's friend. <laughs> yeah. And well. Please uh, tell us about that. I've been asked to wear it a few times, but I have not done that because. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> no, no. In jest, in jest. But he's been around with us for a number of years. He's actually using one of our fundraising campaigns back in the 1950s, the Champions Campaign. And they <laughs> did have somebody wearing it, uh, going around and raising money for the Evansville Museum. Uh, so he's, he has a long legacy uh, with our with our institution. He, I'm using a, 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 a male moniker, but assuming a male wore this suit of armor. Well, Tom, you know, it was the former mayor's son who would actually, in quote, um, from Siegfried Wang's um, periodical they left behind that, in quote, the mayor's son would be put into the suit of armor. He yes, would hang those... out the side of a car and he would have this banner, Evansville Museum, because they were trying to build our first well, institution. <laughs> we, had no, we had no shame. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and it seemed to work. <laughs> yes. it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful story. Tori told me this and I said, well, let's, let's get a picture of that armor in here um, and get something in for the gentleman, even if it's only a postscript to the long discussion. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, about the ladies. So, so um, we're gonna we're gonna take this as a departure point, just to look and see what elements you have in your armor. Um, by the way, is that a hacksaw down beneath his hand there? Oh, that, that, <laughs> yes, that is not a. That's a bit anachronistic now, isn't it? <laughs> a little too modern for for a man. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me just say it. It adds to the sense of urgency and danger. <laughs> Yes. No saws were used during the capital campaign project, the Evansville Museum of 59. <laughs> Wonderful. That's right. I love it. I love it. Um, uh, so this this piece, if you, now you've had a chance to study it, let's go forward and just spend a few minutes on armor in my period. So first of all, I have a detail of the helmet you of, of your museum on the left. And I thought you'd like to compare it with one uh, here. This is a painting um, uh, by a follower of Branzino. His name is um, uh, Maso de San Friano, and he died young, but he was a super gifted artist. So there are not very many paintings by him at all. So it's a, it's a rare thing. And what it is, it's a portrait of Francesco I before he took over the role as the head of state. So he's not wearing um, any regalia that would tell you he's a leader, but he's wearing partial armor, which tells you that he's a leader in training, if you will. Um, and this is, this is actually what happened in his life was that he was born um, in 1545, um, in 1565, when he was 20, he married Joanna of Austria, who we just met. His father um, abdicated in 64, but his father was still alive for 10 more years, Cosimo I. And in reality, Francesco didn't get to really have power very much. This painting probably is um, uh, somewhere in that period where he, can, he can't wear any regalia. Um, but what you notice is he's wearing a circlet of armor that protects your neck at the top, um, from which you know fluffs up this incredibly flouncy um, uh, underblouse collar. Beneath that, though, he's not below that. I should say he's not wearing armor. He's wearing a satin doublet. Um, so he's only partially dressed in armor. He's, put, he's either putting it on or taking it off. Um, nobody goes around like this. I mean, you can't fight anybody like this, right? Um, your stomach is just asking for trouble. 
uh, he, uh, so we, in his helmet, he's resting. He rests his hand on the top of the helmet. Um, it has uh, three feathers at the top, which are probably symbolic colors, actually, um, uh, of, of the country. He's, he, this shows you, I should say, if you, if you put your cursor along the top of his helmet, it sh shows you how your helmet opens. So the top part um, it lifts up. And then you see there's an in, there should be an inner part that protects your forehead, which is where Tori has her cursor now. So the detail of your helmet uh, mm -hmm. is juxtaposed so that you can see exactly how the helmet would work, ideally if it has all of its parts. So there is an interior section after you lift the top that protects the head, the forehead of the wearer. And if you think about it, this is like three levels of protection. Once that thing snaps down, um, uh, it, it is really quite strong. Mm -hmm. Then at the base or the neck, it flares out. That comes out over, if you put your pointer, perfect. That comes out over the little circlet that Francesco is wearing in the painting. So there are multiple layers. And then over that would go the armor, more the armor of the chest areas um, of the figure. So what, he's, what I think he's doing here is he's showing you um, that he's getting ready to get fully dressed for some kind of event so that he's put on that lower level, which is the collar. I'll call it the mm -hmm. collar. That's not its correct name. Um, he's got his helmet ready. He's mm -hmm. going to wait to the last moment with the, to put the helmet on because it's somewhat uncomfortable for breathing. By the way, they're very hot as well. Did you know that they are padded inside with an incredibly thick horsehair quilting um, originally so, so that they don't scratch your face or cut you, um, uh, as a matter of fact. So if he puts on his center piece over his chest, then he could start to be ready for either hand-to-hand -hand combat or horse combat um, or group combat. So we'll see an example in a moment. Um, so if we go forward to the next, here, here uh, I wanted to show you what that top part would look like. So here is, believe it or not, we finally met Eleonora's hubby. This is Cosimo. Um, in one of the over 30 copies of his official court portrait and armor. So when we talk about how many facsimiles are made, this is a good example. There are 30 at least in the world. This one's in um, uh, the Born, uh, Thyssen Bornemisma collection in Madrid. Um, there's one in the Uffizi. There's one in Toledo, Ohio, by the way. Uh, yep. <laughs> uh, believe it or not. Um, so here he is against a green curtain. Uh, this painting is probably 1540 to 1544, around in there. So it's about the same time as Eleonora with her, her with one son. Um, and he rests his hand on the same kind of helmet uh, called a burgonet, B-U-R-G-O-N-E-T. Um, with those two flaps that we just explored. He also, however, has put on his central breastplate or cuirass, C-U-I-R-A-S-S, -A -S, like in Roman armor, perfect. Notice the additions. Look at those spiky things that look like discs. Um, those are uh, those are for real. Those are placed over your armpit to protect your armpit if you raise your arm, which is an extremely uh, vulnerable area. And if you are struck there, um, you will bleed to death quite quickly. Uh, so they knew that's they they are performative in every sense of the word. Um, and you can see. If you look very closely at his neck, I think you can see the under collar that's underneath, like a cylindrical collar. And then on top of it is his next piece. 
So now we see what he, where he added his on. Then you add shoulders, pauldrons, they're called. There's your shoulders, okay? And then right, um, let's go for my next slide, please. Let's see if I have some details. I hope, oh, good. So this detail focuses at the elbow and notice that, whoops, this detail is focusing on the elbow and notice that it's a piece that on each, it's round, but each side slightly is canted upward. That's so you can move your arm. That's so you can bend your arm. Exactly, right there. And also at the opposite side, so you can bend the upper arm. Um, it allows for not complete rotation, but some. Mm. Uh, that's called a, a cooter, C-O-U-T-E-R, and that is a standard uh, of uh, uh, field armor. That is to say, when you're really going to fight somebody hand-to-hand uh, -hand on the field. And the next slide, I think, is a detail of, yep, your helmet. So you can really see um, the detailing and how the rivets that hold parts of it together are gilded. And then in his, the lower section that covers your chin actually was hinged so it can open like a gate in front of your chin so you can breathe. But yet the whole rest of the helmet could still be on, if that makes sense. And so it has a gilded hinge right there too. Um, it is also, uh, I should have said that the material here is steel, as is yours. Actually, the, the armor Cosimo is wearing was given to him as a gift um, by one of the Habsburgs. And the helmet we know was, was handcrafted in Innsbruck by a master metal worker who'd made armor for the uh, Habsburg starting with Maximilian the first in 1500 ish. So with, the, with so a real history, a family with like three generations, they're the best in the world. And so that helmet is also, it's a gift from um, uh, a diplomatic gift, if you will, uh, which then is, is immortalized in the painting. We have a few pieces of his armor left believe it or not, in the world. Not all of it, uh, but several of the pieces ha can be identified based on this painting by Branzino. And let's see what else we have here. I think I'm coming to my final bits. Um, I felt that the, this is sort of my uh, final comparison to your armor, but also we're ending here with Francesco Primo um, probably uh, just after his marriage to Joanna in 1565. Here he's depicted, this is by the way, a life-size painting uh, in a museum in Antwerp. And it is also known from a version at uh, the Schloss Ambrose. Uh, so therefore, once again, once he married a Habsburg, they had to have a portrait of him up in the North. So that's how one got there. Um, and it shows him in armor. Uh, and now we, we're really familiar with a lot of this now. We see the, the Bergenet style helmet on the table. We see the interior collar, then the cuirass, the cuirass, the breastplate, the pauldrons on his shoulders. He had he has cooters again at his elbows. You're going to see the extra bits of the arm the, the arm cylinders and the bottom part. And you'll note that he's not wearing leg armor. Um, I had to learn this from a great armor expert, but I was told that this is because this particular outfit mm -hmm. is armor that you would wear for a uh, ritual, a sort of celebratory ritual fun combat on horseback in which you used a lance and he also has, it's hard to see, but there's a bolt uh, on his proper left elbow. It looks like a dot of light. And it is a uh, part of an apparatus 
to screw your lance onto your arm. So a big heavy, uh, further to your right on his elbow. That little fleck, yeah, uh, on the oh. outer elbow. And uh, it's part oh. of a lance rest, uh, which was more complicated than, than we can see. Part of it is not visible. But when you have a heavy lance, which is still you, and you're just, you're, you know, maybe you're not a bodybuilder, it might be hard to hold up your six foot, eight foot, 10 foot long lance if you're, you know, not really athletic, um, which is quite heavy. And you're now on a horse and you're charging at somebody. Um, and the reason you don't need leggings is because this particular type of combat was called um, combat of the tilt, T-I-L-T, -T, as if tilting, uh, inclining. A tilt is actually a wooden separation, a barrier, and one horseman is on each side of it as they come barreling towards one another. And so typically they did not wear armor on their legs for this. So mm. we discovered by doing some research that actually um, uh, in his youth, bef slightly before he married Joanna, uh, Francesco had traveled to Madrid um, and had met the future Philip II and was taken with a tilt match that was celebrated over Easter, the year he was there. And he started practicing in, quote, the backyard, close quote, according to an ambassador for such a thing. So it's probable that this is the armor was, this particular armor was for that event. And that sort of gives us a date. So we're in the 15, early 1560s here um, for this, but it gives us the complete historical context. And he probably wanted to commemorate this because it was part of this huge trip he took to Spain. Um, and to be really, he spent months there and he impressed them with his Spanish, with his, with his Spanish, I beg your pardon, with, with that his mother had taught him. Now, if we go to the next slide, hopefully, those are all of my details of it. And just maybe, is there one more? Yes. Yeah. And you'll notice that the bottom part of your armor is exactly that shape. I wondered a bit about that. Um, I can't be sure, but I can tell you that even if uh, one added the steel leggings here, you mm -hmm. definitely also had the padded, what I'll call breeches, um, simply because of comfort. Uh, and these are often made, uh, uh, they're padded, highly padded for comfort, both for sitting in a horse, but also for, for being, for accepting jolts if you got struck. Sometimes they were constructed of thick leather straps that were cut in order to allow movement. Um, uh, uh, and that's what this looks like here, as a matter of fact. So you're, you need to add that to your armor, and then you're ready to go. Take notes, Tom. Yes, now we know. <laughs> now we know how it's supposed to be. Exactly, and we're and, most grateful for that. Absolutely. <laughs> well, listen. Thank you very much. I hope um, our little tour of dress and armor has been profitable. It's been fascinating. Absolutely. It, it, as we learn more about our material, it's just yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for send, having if, me. If we could send you a check, we would. But. <laughs> 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 well, you know, maybe there's some way down the road. Who knows? Yes. I think so. <laughs> that we can extend our gratitude. Yes. Super. Mm -hmm. um, well, actually, I, I know exactly what you can do is that you can have with that dress that Tori published on Facebook the other day, have it sized up to a modern size six and send it to me. <laughs> I think Clara Bow would be more than happy to do that for oh, you. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm.